Yeah, as, uh, as was said, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, a question that I, that I often get from PMs about how um, the product that uh, our team is, is building is, is likely uh, on its way to demise. Um, I thought that that would be a fun topic, kind of the elephant in the room um, that, uh, that we could try to address, but also um, use it as a way to um, uh, help, help folks uh, think about how, how we think about building products uh, with AI and how we're thinking about evolving our product, and hopefully there's some, some lessons and some applicable learnings there for um, all of you who are thinking about building products um, with, uh, with AI. Um, so with that, let's get started. Right, so uh, have LLMs killed Grammarly? Um, um, or, maybe, or maybe like more, more specifically, um, you know, if everyone is adding like LLM functionality into every single other writing surface, um, you know, what is, what is Grammarly's right to exist? Um, how is Grammarly gonna kind of navigate this? This is a question that I get from almost every PM that I interview. And by the way, I interview a lot of PMs. We are hiring across every function if you are uh, interested uh, in, in uh, coming in and talking to us. Um, but again, I, I, I wanted to uh, try to address this directly because I think there's a lot that we can learn not only from what Grammarly is doing, but that can be applicable to the products that you are all, you are all building. Um, I wanted to throw my photo up here again in case you were wondering who we were talking to. I thought we could do that twice. I even decided to wear the same shirt as in the photo um, so that you knew for sure that I was really him. Um, it's a form of, of verification. Um, so we made sure and put that in there. Thank you uh, for that. Um, but anyway, so um, I'm sure all of you have, have heard this, have, have read this, maybe uh, have these own questions about um, you know, the, the death and demise of, of Grammarly um, with everything that's going on with LLMs, um, you know, uh, the ability to kind of shorten, lengthen, correct words appearing in, in every text box. Um, certainly that, that means the, the demise of Grammarly, what Apple is doing, et cetera, et cetera, what Microsoft is putting in, in Word and, and Google and Docs and, and so on. But the, the, the funny thing is that um, all of these things that are written up here are actually is what people have been saying about Grammarly for a very long time. Um, this, is, this is nothing new. Um, you know, Grammarly has been working on providing uh, a, a solution that works everywhere you work to correct your words everywhere, everywhere that you write. And since the inception of the company, there's been the same question. I don't get it. There's spell checking and grammar checking and Google Docs. Uh, it's in the browser, it's in Microsoft Office. Like how is Grammarly uh, going to survive, what is the, what is the point of, of Grammarly? Um, but despite that, um, we've actually grown a pretty significant business. Um, I really want to tell you how big the business is, but my comms team will not allow me. So uh, you'll have to catch me one-on-one -on -one in the bathroom when they're not in the crowd um, so that I can share all of our metrics with you. Um, just kidding, Darlene. Uh, <laughs> um, but the, the point is, is that we have grown a fairly significant um, and large business. And one thing I can share that we share publicly is the business has been profitable since day one. Um, it is a very profitable, very efficient business because we are solving, I think, a very acute problem for a large number of people. For a very long time, Grammarly was kind of in the quiet backwaters of technology. We didn't want anyone to notice us. We had found this, this secret gem that we can kind of grow and turn into a really large business. But clearly, um, you know, the idea that machines will assist all of us to communicate in very significant ways is no longer a quiet backwaters idea. It's an idea that has kind of come into the forefront, um, even though it's a, an idea that Grammarly has had for a really long time. Obviously, our entire industry now realizes that this is a, this is a foregone conclusion. The question is, how do we get from, from here to there? So, um, you know, as I said, a very, very healthy business, but the, the one stat that I want to point to here just to give you an idea uh, of, the, of the scale and, and kind of what, what Grammarly has created is, um, you know, in a, in a given year, given our, our current uh, usage, we process about 25 trillion tokens a year and, and growing. And just to give you a sense of, um, you know, that scale, I believe Facebook, or excuse me, Meta, um, trained um, Llama 3 on about 15 trillion tokens. So it's a fairly significant amount of uh, you know, words that, that are coming through our system. Um, we obviously get to see how these words are written and rewritten. Um, we obviously understand what applications, um, what, what, what tasks. We do all this in a very privacy-preserving manner, uh, 
an anonymized manner, um, we're very careful about uh, how we associate kind of user users with uh, with text. But the point is, is that you know, despite this kind of uh, consistent question around what is the what is the place or a potential value of Grammarly, uh, we still manage to kind of uh, grow a fairly significant um, business. And so the question I think to ask is like, how did we do that, and what can we learn from that um, kind of going forward? So how did we grow this this business? So um, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Inside Eye 2, but this is, uh, this is the emotion anxiety. And the way we grew this business is we just have a lot of anxiety. Um, like we are like very anxious about growing this business uh, and losing this business. And it turns out anxiety is a really good motivating force to build fantastic products. Um, I'm kidding, obviously. Uh, uh, but but the, uh, the, the first thing I'm gonna say is like, why, why did Grammarly, um, Work. What, what is what is the fit? Why why do we manage to grow uh, such a substantial business? And I do think that one of the one of the fundamental things is that um, or very early on, Grammarly understood very clearly the customer problem that they were trying to address, and that problem was anxiety. Many many people are worried or anxious that their words are somehow going to get in their way whether they're writing an essay and they really care about getting that grade, or they're communicating at work and it's a, it's a tense situation um, and they're worried about their words somehow misrepresenting them and getting in their, and getting in their way. These are not people who are just uh, you know, English second language or, or um, you know, uh, understand remedial English or something like that. This is much broader. Um, it's, it's engineers who didn't sign up uh, to work in order to like write a bunch of communication to a bunch of other people. They like to code, right? Um, it's it's people across all functions who simply you know have uh, some concern and worry about about their words. And Grammarly understood that very very early on and understood that that was the customer pain point that they were addressing. And what we did is that we delivered confidence to address that customer pain point. The product is not marketed around fear or anxiety or, or things like that. The product is trying to constantly reinforce confidence, explaining why these words, why we're making these suggestions, to try and give people the feeling that they can communicate more confidently, that they can write more confidently, um, such that um, their ideas uh, and, their, and their best selves are represented when they are communicating at work or, or uh, for school purposes. Um, <clears throat> the other reason that, that I think Grammarly um, really managed to build a very significant business um, in, in, this, in this space, despite what everyone else uh, was doing, was what I would call, like, uh, just say, honestly say, uh, fantastic UX, uh, fantastic product experience. And again, I think there's something that I'll get to in a moment that there's a lot to learn from this in terms of how to build with these, with these models today. But Grammarly is a seemingly very simple product. And like all other very simple products under the hood, it's actually like quite complicated to deliver that simplicity at, at scale um, to the number of customers that we have. So Grammarly is one of the few products out there. It's almost like the, if I were to use the buzzwords of today, Grammarly is one of like the earliest agents. We're like almost there to agent. Uh, you just install us, you don't have to configure us or do anything else, and we just make you better. You continue doing um, what you're doing, wherever you'd like to do it, and in real time, we push suggestions uh, and recommendations to you, and we make it incredibly easy to accept or ignore those suggestions. All you have to do to get value from Gram Grammarly is hover over an underline. And I think this is a really important lesson for all of us who are building products with AI and are trying to drive growth. Every click really matters. The fact that users don't have to pull value from Grammarly, the fact that we push value to where the users are, and we are trying to do that in a way that's not annoying as fuck, but we're getting better at that. Um, um, the fact that all you have to do is hover and get value from Grammarly is a huge, um, a huge reason for, for the, the company's success and for the, for the products. Uh, growth, And I think that when you're building with AI and you're building with these models and you're thinking about how do I get to the cost, quality, latency equation where I can deliver functionality in this way 
in a way that millions of people can understand how to use, um, I think that is a, is a really good, good lesson there. And so under these, under these uh, simple underlines is actually like a great deal of uh, engineering work um, and a great deal of, of optimization. Even just integrating with other people's applications in order to be able to decorate the words in a real-time way is a significant challenge to kind of do at scale with the number of applications um, that we support. So again, seems, seems uh, uh, very simple, um, but actually uh, um, you know, quite, a, quite a complicated product underneath. And it looks like I might be missing the, the, the next slide, but the, the last point that I'll say um, is, so there's, there's um, uh, the, the, product, the product experience, um, there's understanding the true customer problem that we're solving. And then I would say for a long time, there has been a strong focus in quality. I think Grammarly understood very early that even small points in, in um, improvements on model quality or evaluated quality actually end up making a very big difference in customer experience and driving revenue, especially when you're working on a feature and a workflow that people are constantly doing. People are constantly writing. They're writing everywhere. 80% of how we spend our time at work for most of us is communication. Um, and so when you when you're, have such a high frequency action and you can even move very small points uh, in quality, the, the differences to the, to the customer and then to the business are quite significant. And for a long time, like very early on, Grammarly was always evaluating its uh, grammar and spelling uh, models against uh, you know, what Google was putting out, what Microsoft was putting out, et cetera. And the company saw that even small improvements in quality actually showed up in, in, our, in our metrics and in the, uh, in the bottom line, excuse me, the top line of, of the business. So I think that's, those are the three things that have really kind of uh, I think at its core, brought us to the business that we are today, despite what everyone else has been, has been providing. It's that understanding the customer uh, problem and pain point, delivering uh, you know, a very sim seemingly simple um, product experience, and then focusing on the, the quality of our suggestions and, and results. Now, <clears throat> fast forward to today, to today, and we're kind of seeing similar, similar headlines, uh, right? Uh, it's the, the same thing that we've been saying uh, for, for a long time. Apple intelligence is, is going to kill Grammarly. Um, you know, ChatGPT is, is going to kill Grammarly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what's going to happen? Like, what, 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 is, what is the truth? Well, I think that, that uh, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're currently writing that story. But I wanted to uh, kind of take a step back for a moment and give you a sense of how we're, how we're thinking about that and how to think, how to reason through um, problems like this and situations like this, but try to make it um, uh, very relevant to perhaps other uh, AI products that folks in the audience might be building. So first thing, when, when you're trying to kind of figure out what to do in these scenarios, I think it's, it's important to kind of like step out of the hype cycle uh, we're all in for, for a moment, right? Um, uh, we have like kind of one understanding and, and one kind of uh, a set of a zeitgeist about like kind of what's going on um, in the industry and with our, with our customers. And we are all, are, most of us are here in the Bay Area, and I would say that's a pretty skewed understanding of like what's going on uh, with, our, with our customers. Sometimes I like to think about uh, Grammarly as the McDonald's of AI, like a billions, billions served. Um, you know, I may not be uh, interested in kind of building the most complex agent that's going to, um, you know, rewrite your whole application stack and clear every single JIRA ticket for you automatically, but if I can find uh, a problem that I can solve that billions of people um, can very easily adopt and use several times in their week, in their, in their month, then that's a business that I'm very, very excited to, to solve. And the reason that I say that is when we when we step out of the hype cycle a little bit and try to understand what problems are people really dealing with? How are they currently using this technology and adopting this technology? It is one of the fastest technologies to ever be adopted, but where are people now and how do we bring them along with us as, as we build um, and, and create something that they, can, that they can actually have a chance of adopting? Um, so, first of all, um, you know what are what are people generally doing um, when when they're when they're prompting? You know, obviously, we see uh, a lot of people prompt LLMs not only within our own products but you know uh, with many other products. So this is just a, a sample that that we took uh, to give give you a sense of kind of what what people are are often doing with these things. 
Obviously, like composing and, and editing and rewriting is, is fairly high uh, on, on the list. Um, we know that coding is a, a use case that is kind of found probably more fit um, and, is, and is really taking hold, but many, many people are still trying to use this technology, obviously, for composing and, and rewriting. You see uh, a whole, a whole the, the third one is no instruction, so it kind of gives you an idea of kind of where, where people are at, what their understanding and ability uh, to, to prompt. Um, and then you know the, the the list gets kind of much much smaller from there. But I want to just kind of also pull up uh, some example prompts that are fun fun to look at, just to give us an idea like where are customers at with this uh, technology today? So like, give me a sentence to put at the cover of the book to make people want to buy it. Um, it's, a, it's a very reasonable thing to, to be asking. Um, uh, surely, if, if the machine could give you the answer to that, that question, uh, uh, it would be great. And I'm not doing this to try and like throw shade on our customers. It's quite the opposite. Um, you know, it's, it's that we, we need to understand kind of um, what the customers are, are trying to do, their understanding of how to use this technology today. And this is our problem, not, not their problem. Um, the fact that people are sort of at this level of, of understanding and ability to work with these, these models and prompt these models is something that we need to fix for and we need to address. We need to make it far easier to interact with these things, optimize their prompts, and perhaps uh, you know, in the future remove the need to prompt entirely. Because my view personally is that prompting is a bug, not a feature, uh, and, and over time, uh, we'll see that more and more of the sort of assistance that we get from, from this AI does not revolve, that's, evolve in, sorry, require that, that sort of active, active prompting. So the next thing to, to think about is, is um, you know, has the problem that you're working on actually truly been solved uh, with where kind of like LOMs and the technology is today. So I don't know how many of you, does, does this, just curious like a show of hands, because this really dates me. Um, does anybody know what these, these are? Does, do you recognize these? Like, it's hard to see you. All right. All right, some of you, awesome. <laughs> uh, so this, this, is, this is a Thomas guide. Uh, for those of you who grew up in Southern California or, or um, you know, are, are traveled in Southern California in the, let's say, late 80s, early, early 90s, this is how we all figured out how to get around. Everyone had one of these maps in their car because driving in LA and other places, it's so vast and, and you go to such different corners um, you know, that, that oftentimes you, you needed a map uh, to figure out how to get to, how to, get to where you're going. Um, and so this was kind of like the state of the art um, at, that, at to that time for, um, for, for navigating and, and helping you get to uh, your destination. And then of course, MapQuest came out, right? And we all thought, amazing, like problem solved. I'm gonna go to a browser, I'm gonna enter my destination before I leave, I'm gonna print out the, the, the directions, I'm gonna take that in my car, and great, I don't have to carry a Thomas guide anymore because now I've got a printout that tells me um, where to go. Problem solved, right? The point I'm trying to make is, the way we're solving a lot of these problems with LLMs and AI today, we're at the MapQuest stage. Um, so just to give you an idea, right? These problems that we're, uh, that we're working on, if you pick the right problem, are far from solved from an LM, are far from solved from ChatGPT, are far from solved by the prompting that you can do in, in Microsoft Word and so on. Um, just in our, in our own customer base, like what we see around how many people are actually frequently using the output of models for day-to-day -day communication, it's very low. Um, and I'm sure that that matches the anecdotal experience like uh, uh, in, this, in this group. What's the last time you wrote a project proposal where you did it almost entirely with the assistance of the model and felt at the end of that process that that was better and faster than if you just kind of did it yourself from start to finish? We're at that stage, right? And I'm not saying this technology is not amazing and that it doesn't have huge potential, but I think it's important to not only remember where are our customers today like what is their understanding of how to use this stuff? And how solved are the problems that we're working on? So before you get skittish because of what one of the foundational labs might be doing, um, you know, so on, I would just consider that these problems are, are far from solved. And actually, um, you know, obviously after MapQuest, we got phones with GPS and built-in directions, but actually the way to solve the navigation problem is not a Thomas guide or MapQuest or a phone with a map. It's self-driving cars, 
That's the way you solve the navigation problem because then navigation is a thing of the past that none of us need to worry about. We just get in the car, we tell it where we want to go, and we can outsource that part of our brain, thank God, um, to then spend, spend time on, on, on other things. But that's, that's an example, I think, of like how you truly and thoroughly solve a problem. And so when you're thinking about the problem that you're working on, that your business or your product is working on, I would just keep in mind that a lot of how we're solving these problems with LLMs today is still at the map class stage. And if you think deeply, and try to solve the problem for your customer quite deeply, that there's a lot more uh, way to go to actually provide a solution that truly solves the problem. Um, and for Grammarly, you know, we are, we are working on trying to help people communicate effectively, trying to make sure that they can show up as their best selves at work for their true brilliance and genius to be understood by everyone that they work with. The first way that we've been trying to solve that very big problem is by supplying correct words. Clearly, supplying correct words is no longer enough to continue to solve that problem, and we need to move on to the next stages uh, of, of that problem to try to get to the self-driving car version of solving the problem, um, where today I think we're very much still at the MapQuest version of solving the problem. Does that analogy kind of work, hopefully? Okay, I'm not just, uh, um, um, I'm not just uh, kidding myself here. Um, all right, man, we, these slides are really outdated. <laughs> um, I think the, the, the other thing that it's, I think is, is really important to um, consider um, when you're uh, thinking about uh, a problem to solve um, for, for your products uh, in terms of what LLMs might do and how they might, might evolve is I think you need to be very careful not to pick a problem that I would say is too broad or maybe another way of saying it is it's too close to next token prediction right, um, and what the models kind of might, might do next. Um, if you fly, I'd say, too close to that sun, you're very, you're very likely to, to, uh, to get burned. So, for example, if you're just working on, um, you know, public domain uh, writing, kind of like generating an, an essay, uh, something, something like that, generating an essay about the U.S. Civil War, that might be a little too close to what a next token predictor trained on internet data may be able to do. Um, you might be flying a little too close to what the LLMs can already do decently well and what they might do um, uh, significantly better in, in, short, in short order. Um, likewise, at least for Grammarly, we want to be careful not to pick a problem that is too narrow. So for example, we observe that there's a lot of legal writing that happens um, with Grammarly. Um, where uh, a lot of lawyers have Grammarly uh, in the loop when they're, when they're writing, writing their, their content. But I think that focusing um, on an LLM that, um, that, that really uh, improves and, and solves the problems of legal writing might be a little too narrow, at least for the TAM that, that Grammarly wants to address or the problem that, that Grammarly wants to address. So it's very important to try to pick that, that problem that I would say is at the right altitude um, for the business that, that you're trying to build that gives you um, the ability not only to kind of build a, a product experience um, and uh, get, get an advantage from either a, a data model, you know, uh, contextual, uh, contextual behavioral data perspective. Um, it's, it's important to kind of pick the, the problem at the, at the right altitude. So for Grammarly, that may be, you know, writing words in a way that are most likely going to be understood or received well by people at work. Um, perhaps it is something about kind of workplace communication and understanding the dynamic about superiors, peers, um, how we typically uh, interact at work and the words that um, kind of help us be successful in those environments. Perhaps it's something about uh, emotion uh, and perception um, and kind of uh, working with that modality to try and have your words uh, land right. We're, we're in the process of discovering exactly which of those problems um, are, are just right for us, but I think it's something that's very, very important to think about. And then when you pick that problem um, that uh, is at the right altitude for, for your business, I, I believe that it's very important to try and solve that problem um, from model to pixel. Um, uh, I think you can get a uh, very far away with, with prompting, um, you know, other models. Uh, but I think fundamentally, oftentimes, to solve some of these problems very deeply, um, you're going to want to have control and uh, the ability to manipulate everything from the model all the way to the pixel that you're delivering to, to the user. And that's what Grammarly has been doing from day one. 
That may not mean that we, um, that we are uh, only using um, models that we have uh, you know, trained, tuned, et cetera, in-house. Um, we're certainly going to use um, uh, the best model available for the task at hand. But I think that there's uh, really something to be said for um, uh, honing, honing and uh, uh, optimizing the model to the pixel for the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and that is how you get to a solution I think that is much more viable and differentiated and much less likely to be, uh, to be gobbled up by what some of these uh, foundational model developers uh, might be doing or what some of these larger productivity suites might be doing. I really think that it is very possible to compete directly uh, with, with, these, with these folks. Um, I just wanna, for everyone in the audience that, that has this worry or, or anxiety about what's the next uh, open AI release that's going to like gobble up my product and, 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 and my business, I would, just, I would just caution you that you are buying into, into their narrative, uh, which is very convenient for them, but not necessarily uh, convenient uh, for all of you. I don't think we know exactly how this is uh, gonna turn out yet, whether those, uh, those models will we'll commoditize and everything that we're all, we're all doing at the application layer is where the value will actually be derived. But regardless, I think that trying to solve these problems from model to pixel, even if you don't end up um, you know, owning the model directly, gives you the understanding that you need in order to build solutions that kind of truly solve um, that problem. Um, so with that, I think that's all for me. Thank you very much for listening and have a good rest of your conference.